This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. guys, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 33, Nakoda Kelly. Upon hearing from his mother that he was to spend the upcoming weekend in his father's custody, 10-year-old Nakoda Kelly told her, my father is going to kill me. Due to a very specific court order, his mom had no choice but to take him on Friday to spend the weekend with his father, Anthony DeBaya. On Saturday evening, Anthony called a cousin in Texas, screaming, I killed my son. In Anthony's Indianapolis apartment, police discovered a crime scene straight out of a horror movie, and several hours later, Anthony, a convicted criminal who was in the United States illegally, was arrested two states away by the Missouri State Highway Patrol. This is a story of a boy failed by DCS and the family court system, and a mother and teenage sister left devastated. This is the horrific story of Nakoda Kelly. My sources for this week are The Indie Channel, Wish TV Crime Watch 8, The Indie Star, Fox 59, Facebook, Indiana Inmate Lookup, Indiana My Case Portal, 13 WTHR, and The Chronicle Tribune. All of the cases I cover are difficult for a variety of reasons, but once in a while a story comes along that is just so disturbing and egregious that it could be the plot of a TV crime drama or an overwrought Hollywood movie. The details are so graphic and grisly that they're almost unbelievable. This is one of those stories. I think it's important to mention up top, though, especially for anyone who's never listened to the podcast before, that the most important thing about my telling of this story is Nakoda himself and who he was as a person. He will not be forgotten, and his death is not just a series of salacious headlines. This little boy's death was preventable, and if Indiana's Department of Child Services and Wabash Circuit Court had heeded the warnings of Nakoda's mother, Haley, the awful story I'm about to tell you may never have happened. With that, let's get into the story. In 2008, 22-year-old Haley Kelly found what she thought was the man of her dreams on a dating website. Miguel Nchama was charismatic and handsome. In one of a series of recent interviews, Haley said, He was a sweet guy when I first met him. She and Miguel spent time together renting movies, going out to eat, and bowling, and before long, she fell head over heels in love with him. After a little more than a year together, Haley became pregnant with Miguel's baby. On May 25, 2010, Nakoda Blake Kelly was born, weighing 7 pounds, 10 ounces. He was a happy, playful little boy with a wide, charming smile, gorgeous brown eyes, and a head full of thick, black, curly hair. Eventually, he would end up wearing glasses. At the time Nakoda was born, Haley already had a -a three-and-a-half-year-old daughter, who I'll call J.K. She adored her new baby brother, and that love would grow into an inseparable bond between the two siblings. It wasn't until Nakoda was almost two years old that Haley discovered the man she loved was not who he said he was. Miguel Nchama turned out to be one of five names her son's father had used over the years. He was born in Nigeria on March 11, 1983, with the name Ajike Ibi, although at some point he may have legally changed it to Anthony Dabaya. According to a criminal complaint filed on August 29, 2011, Anthony was charged with fraud, misuse of visa or permits, misuse of social security number, and fraud with identification documents. According to the Indy Star, he was accused of using a former friend's name and identifying information while working at Sally May in Muncie, where he had access to people's financial information. Court documents also show that Anthony was ordered to be held in custody, stating, Dabaya is not a citizen of the United States and could be the citizen of Nigeria. The documents reveal that Anthony possessed identification documents in the names of three other people. 
The man whose identity Anthony was accused of stealing was a friend named Judson Mbunuzu, whose family Anthony lived with briefly in 2002. Anthony used the man's name and social security number to work, obtain loans, file taxes, and rent an apartment in Muncie. If Muncie, Indiana sounds familiar, it may be because another case I covered recently on the podcast, that of Lauren McConnell, also played out there. Regarding her discovery that she was dating a con man, Haley said, I felt betrayed. I was mad. I didn't trust him anymore. She did, however, still love the man, at least until he became more and more controlling, and she finally became fed up and broke up with him. After their breakup, she said, Anthony talked down to her and insulted her, picking on her looks and her weight. In 2012, Anthony pleaded guilty to social security fraud, identity theft, and misusing documents to stay in the country, and was sentenced to 34 months in federal prison. Near the end of his sentence, a judge ordered him deported, but according to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Nigeria refused to take him back. I had no idea countries could do that. The Indy Star reported that the United States Supreme Court has ruled the government unable to imprison someone indefinitely who's in the country illegally in cases where it's unlikely that they'll obtain the documents needed for deportation. Evidently, it has forced ICE to release thousands of immigrants who would otherwise have been deported. ICE spokesperson Nicole Alberico told a news outlet, Unable to secure proper travel documents from Nigeria, on October 29, 2014, ICE officers had to release Tobaya on order of supervision. With the United States unable to deport him to his home country, Anthony Tobaya was free to walk the streets when his son, Nakoda, was four and a half years old. Nakoda always seemed to have a smile on his face, even though he didn't have the easiest life. On top of having problems breathing while he slept, necessitating surgery in 2014, Nakoda was also diagnosed with several other conditions throughout the years, including severe ADHD, sensory processing disorder, pervasive developmental disorder, a mild learning disability related to autism, and a speech impediment. He was, at least at one point, on medication for his conditions. We've seen it time and time again, and statistics bear it out. Children with mood, behavior, or learning difficulties are at a higher risk of parental abuse than neurotypical children. Yes, these kids can be hard to deal with. Haley reported that one of her challenges with Nakoda was that at times, he had such a hard time getting to sleep that he would stay up the entire night. Of course, that, among various other behaviors, could be frustrating. But Anthony didn't have to deal with it. He chose to. There was a period of time, possibly a year or more, during which Haley didn't hear from Anthony at all. When he did get in touch with her, he demanded a DNA test to prove Nakoda's paternity. Then, in October of 2016, Anthony went to Wabash Circuit Court for visitation with Nakoda. After the little boy's first overnight visit with his father on New Year's Day of 2017, Haley filed her first abuse allegation, saying Anthony gave Nakoda a double dose of his ADHD medication. Anthony explained it was a mistake, saying he thought he was supposed to give Nakoda both pills at once instead of one each day of the visit. That allegation was determined to be unsubstantiated. Haley recently spoke with Indy Star, Fox 59, and WTHR in her first media interviews since Nakoda's death and she provided at least one of the news outlets with documentation of four of the five formal abuse complaints she made against Anthony to DCS over the years. She did not yet have the documentation back for her fifth complaint, which she made on May 5th of this year. Haley told WTHR, Nakoda, at first, was excited to go with his dad, and then, all of a sudden, he wasn't excited anymore, and I knew something was wrong. In February of 2017, Haley filed another complaint, telling DCS that Nakoda had suffered bruises after Anthony dragged him down the stairs. During another incident the same year, Haley was sitting in church when she received a weird text which prompted her to try calling and texting Anthony. After nine hours of panic and uncertainty, Anthony finally returned her call to say everything was fine. They hadn't been busy, he just hadn't bothered to respond to her frantic messages. He seemed to revel in making Haley squirm and he was bound and determined to show her he was in control of the situation. In November of 2017, Haley complained that Anthony hit Nakoda so hard in the face that her son fell backwards over a couch, landing on his back. He didn't feel safe at his dad's house. His dad would hit him, um, and he yelled at him a lot. It's a lot of yelling. A month later, she posted on Facebook, I hate it. There is no one out there that will help kids anymore. In June of 2018, she reported to DCS that Nakoda was present when Anthony threatened to beat her. She said Anthony never did hit her. I noticed that every time I reported it, the abuse got worse and it got more secretive. 
According to court and DCS records, caseworkers said they could not substantiate either parent's side of the disputes. The same month, Haley made a post that read, I am stressing about what happened when I picked my son up from his dad. His dad spit in my face, threatened to beat my ass because I told him not to hit my son ever again. Yeah, some of you will say, well, report it to DCS. They have not helped. My son got overdosed by his dad. They did nothing. He got pulled down the staircase and left bruises on his hands. They did nothing. A friend replied, You cannot let him teach Nakoda that it is okay to treat a woman that way. Haley responded, I know, but I don't know how to get the visits to stop. I told the judge I don't feel safe with him with him. In July of 2018, Haley filed a motion with Wabash Circuit Court asking for Nakoda's visits with his father to be supervised, but the court instead ordered them to meet with a mediator. Haley said, My lawyer told me we didn't have enough evidence. We didn't have enough to go on because DCS unsubstantiated each and every time. At one point, Haley refused to send Nakoda with his father, but shortly thereafter, the police showed up at her Wabash, Indiana home, threatening to arrest her if she did not allow Anthony to take their son. I was told if I did not send him, then I would lose custody, and he would still be with his dad. Out of options, Haley relented. In August of 2018, Haley posted, Please keep me and my son in your prayers, as I might be going to court Tuesday if I can't get a later court date for a later time. I am trying to find a lawyer I can afford. I am doing this because Nakoda needs the abuse to stop. Later the same month, she posted again. So mad, why ask for visits with your kid and hit them? Gotta do something, just don't know what. On November 30th of that year, Haley and Anthony signed a mediation agreement that stated they would set aside prior disputes and never withhold parenting time if they suspect abuse or other issues and will let the court deal with it. In January of 2019, Haley posted an image that read, I would give my last breath so my child could have another. My heart is absolutely broken for her, because I'm sure Haley now feels that sentiment more powerfully than ever. Haley is the kind of mom who makes her kids' birthday cakes every year, who makes crafty valentines for them, who spends hours learning new ways to style their hair, and who pays attention to every detail. Her entire Facebook profile is filled with photos of her two children, and she is obviously bursting with pride to be their mom. Even Dakota told a DCS caseworker himself that his father abused him. According to Haley, he said, My dad hit me. My dad smacks me. I don't want to go with my dad anymore. He's mean. He yells in my face. He doesn't feed me enough. Despite pleading for supervised visits between Anthony and his son, Haley said, Anthony was allowed to continue unsupervised visitation with Dakota. She said, I felt like they were letting me down and letting my son down. I felt like DCS had enough evidence, and they didn't do what they needed to do to protect my son. Haley had long ago realized that relations between herself and her ex-boyfriend were smoother when he got his way, so she had become accustomed to giving in to him. Whenever Nakoda was with Anthony, however, Haley worried herself sick. I spent most of my days crying when he wasn't with me. Haley told Indy Star that Nakoda often cried when Haley told him he had to go for visitation with his father. I just assured him that I would see him Sunday, she said, at least until July 19, 2020, when there was a Sunday I didn't see him. On July 14, 2020, Nakoda made an alarming statement to Haley. He was afraid to spend the weekend with Anthony, knowing his father would not have forgotten about Nakoda hanging up the phone on his father because Nakoda did not want to speak with him, according to court documents. Haley told a caseworker with the Department of Child Services that on July 14th, after being informed that he would be spending the weekend at his father's home in Indianapolis, Nakoda replied, Oh, I'm dead. Don't expect me to come home. When asked for clarification, Nakoda told his mother, My dad is going to kill me. It is unclear what actions, if any, DCS took after receiving Haley's report, but regardless, nothing was done to prevent the upcoming weekend visit. A lot of commenters online spewed blame and vitriol in Haley's direction over her decision to send Nakoda with his father, despite his concerns about his father wanting to kill him. I spent a good deal of time defending Haley in those online comment threads, just as I've spent most of the past week defending Max Schollenberger's biological mother, Sarah, who I interviewed on last week's podcast, against similarly judgmental comments. Listen up. I'm going to give you a few reasons that Haley, like Sarah, isn't responsible for her son's death. One. Haley made what she thought was the best decision at the time. It's easy now, after this tragedy has occurred, to say what you would have done in the situation. They weren't your circumstances, and everyone's experience is different. Two, Haley was court-ordered to allow visitation. Remember, when she refused, the police forced her to comply. 
Refusing could have landed her in jail, and what help would she be to either of her children behind bars? Nakota would have ended up with his father at that point anyway. Three, kids say things like, my parents are going to kill me all the time, and it's generally considered a euphemism for getting in trouble. It's not likely anyone could have predicted it would actually happen. Okay, I'm jumping down off my soapbox now. A judge had ordered that Nakota's weekend visitations would begin at 6 p.m. on Fridays, but because Nakota's final Little League baseball game of the season was scheduled for the evening of Friday, July 17th, Haley took a stand against Anthony, which she now believes was the event that triggered his murderous act. It was his last game. I made him miss his game on Saturdays, but Fridays I thought Anthony could work with me. In her text messages with Anthony that morning, she invited him to attend Nakota's baseball game, but Anthony responded that he would call the police and my lawyer will file citation against you. Nonetheless, Haley brought Nakota to Anthony when the game was over, at which time Anthony was furious and told Haley he would never work with her again. Haley tearfully told WTHR, The day he left, he said, Mom, I still love my dad, and I still want to see him. I just want to be safe. And I told him I was doing the best I could to ensure that I could keep him safe, and I couldn't. The next day, police say, Anthony murdered his 10-year-old son. Haley last heard Nakota's voice during a phone call on Saturday, July 18th at 7.36 p.m. He told her he had just eaten a couple of Lunchables and was watching YouTube on his phone. In an interview, Haley said tearfully, I told him that I would see him tomorrow and told him I loved him and missed him. And we had this saying that we would say when we hang up the phone. I would say, I love you. He would say, I love you more. I would say, I love you the most. He would say, no, I love you. Google, times infinity and beyond. Ha, I win. It was just our saying. My younger son and I, and I'm sure countless other parents and their kids, play the same who loves who more game all the time. So hearing that just tore at my heart. About two hours after Haley's phone call with Nakota, a cousin of Anthony's in Texas called 911 and said he had received a text message and then a call from Anthony DeBaya. Anthony and this cousin hadn't spoken for nearly 20 years until they reconnected about a month before. The cousin told the dispatcher that Anthony, who was weeping, screamed over and over, I just killed my son. Anthony asked for the cousin's address, but the cousin refused to provide it. This apparently upset Anthony, and the cousin hung up and immediately called 911. According to court documents, when the cousin asked Anthony why he had killed Nakota, Anthony replied that his son's mother had given him a very hard time and had cost him a lot of money in court. Just after 10 p.m. on Saturday evening, Indianapolis police went to the Ashton Point Apartments at 6007 West Lake South Drive to perform a welfare check. Anthony's vehicle, a white Jeep Patriot, was parked in the parking lot. Officers knocked on the door of apartment E and heard someone moving around inside, but they received no answer. Feeling there was no reason to force entry, the officer left. Remember, a murder had just been confessed, and they still didn't feel there was any need to force entry. On the morning of Sunday, July 19th, police received another report, this one from a friend of Anthony's. The friend said he had received a call from Anthony that morning asking to borrow a suitcase, to which the friend agreed. Shortly after that call, at 11.43 a.m., Anthony called the friend again. According to Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Detective Jonathan Schultz in a probable cause affidavit filed in Marion Superior Court, Anthony said he used a bag to suffocate his son until he stopped breathing. Anthony told the friend he then took his son to the bathroom to make sure he was dead and he has now dumped the body. Police responded again to Anthony's apartment building, at which time Anthony's vehicle was no longer parked in the lot. This time, because of the second report, authorities were taking the situation seriously enough to deem it necessary to enter the apartment, which they did after obtaining a key from building management. Inside, they found neither Anthony nor Nakota. What they found instead was a crime scene straight out of a gruesome horror film. There was a small amount of blood in the apartment's entrance. Much worse, in the bathroom, police found a large amount of blood splattered on the walls, floor, and ceiling, and both hair and brain matter on the bathroom floor. Based on the evidence inside the apartment, authorities immediately believed Nakota Blake Kelly was dead. IMPD homicide detectives, child abuse detectives, the Indianapolis Marion County Forensic Services Agency, and the Marion County Coroner were summoned to the crime scene at Anthony DeBaya's apartment. Investigators obtained surveillance video in which Anthony is seen making numerous trips from the apartment to his vehicle, placing items into the back of the vehicle with each trip. During one trip, he is seen placing a bag inside the complex's communal dumpster. 
Between 2.27 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. on July 19th, Anthony's vehicle is seen leaving the parking lot and returning several times. Also on July 19th, Haley contacted the DCS caseworker again after she received a text message from Anthony at 2.01 p.m., reading, Sometimes I hear voices. My son is in heaven. How much do you want to bet he's trying to set up an insanity defense? Haley did not believe at the time that Nakoda was dead, saying, I feared he would hurt him and put marks on him and would run with him. I never thought he would kill him. She reported the text message to DCS, who forwarded it to Indianapolis detectives. After searching the apartment, investigators traced Anthony's cell phone location and were able to ascertain that he was driving through Illinois toward the Missouri border. The same afternoon at about 4 p.m., Anthony DeBaya was located and detained when the Missouri State Highway Patrol spotted him traveling alone in his white Jeep Patriot near Highway 38. IMPD detectives traveled to Missouri to follow up on the investigation, but Anthony refused to give them a statement and was arrested. Blood was found in the back of his vehicle. Anthony was transported to the Macon County Jail, where he was ordered to be extradited back to Indiana before August 3rd. He was charged with murder in the presumed death of his 10-year-old son, Nakoda. The Marion County Prosecutor's Office said a conviction in this case would result in either life in prison without parole or the death penalty. Nakoda's Little League teammates affectionately called him Fergie, possibly after Baseball Hall of Famer Ferguson Fergie Jenkins, a Canadian pro baseball pitcher and coach who played for the Philadelphia Phillies, the Chicago Cubs, the Texas Rangers, and the Boston Red Sox. That Fergie is known as one of the best ever pitchers in baseball. At their baseball game on the evening of Monday, July 20th, Nakoda's team, the Pirates, saved a spot for him on the roster and on the field, and a moment of silence was held for him. That same evening, community members gathered at around 5.30 p.m. in the parking lot of the Bachelor Creek Church of Christ for a prayer vigil for the safe return of Nakoda. On Wednesday, July 22nd, the church made an updated Facebook post. Please join us in prayer for Nakoda's family during this difficult time. Nakoda will be missed by all who knew him. He loved playing baseball with his friends and had a smile that lit up the room. We long for the day when death will be no more. A vigil was held on July 26th outside the Wabash County Courthouse, where several people gave speeches and attendees lit candles in memory of Nakoda. On August 2nd, Anthony was transported from Missouri to Indiana and booked into the Marion County Jail, where he was ordered held without bond. At a court hearing on Tuesday, August 4th, Marion County Superior Court Judge Chatrice M. Flowers ordered Anthony to submit to a forensic buccal swab or cheek swab. She also set the date for Anthony's jury trial to begin at 9 a.m. on Monday, November 23, 2020. The following day, Anthony was seen in court again, at which time Judge Flowers swore him in and read the single charge against him, murder. Unlike many other states, Indiana does not differentiate between different levels of murder, so there is no first-degree versus second-degree murder. For a homicidal act to be considered murder in Indiana, the act must be considered intentional. Anthony has been charged with murder under Indiana Code, Title 35, Article 43, Chapter 1, Section 1, a person knowingly or intentionally kills another human being. Marion County Prosecutor Ryan Mears will be arguing the state's case against Anthony DeBaya at trial, along with Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Ann Frangos and Attorney Kristen Orr. Due to indigence, Anthony was assigned to public defender Brian K. Lamar, who has since told a reporter he had no comment on the case other than to say we are investigating all aspects of the case and we will provide a vigorous defense for Anthony. Anthony's next court date is a pretrial conference scheduled for Thursday, November 5th. In August, the Wabash Little League made a post about the end of this year's baseball season, mentioning Nakota in their post. Ending the season on a sad note, we lost Nakota Kelly. The American League Pirates will long remember Nakota, as will the Wabash Little League family remember him. We don't know why bad things happen in this world, and this tragedy has shaken us all. Please continue to keep this family in your prayers. I dug up just a little additional information about Anthony, and I want to add it in here. In August of 2019, after a bench trial in small claims court that he didn't attend, Anthony was ordered to pay a debt owed to one main financial group, totaling $5,800 and change, including court costs and attorney fees. This appears to be a medical debt incurred at St. Vincent Hospital in Indianapolis. Since Anthony completely ignored the judgment, he was ordered to appear in court in January of 2020 under the threat of wage garnishment. 
Then a civil collection complaint was filed by Crown Asset Management LLC in November of 2019. Due to Anthony's default on a $5,000 retail installment loan with WebBank slash Prosper Funding LLC, the company sought damages of nearly $5,000 plus court costs. Anthony opened the loan electronically in May of 2018 and made his last installment payment on it in August of the same year. Anthony DeBaya filed for bankruptcy on January 2, 2020 in Indianapolis. According to the Indy Star, he listed about $31,000 in debts, including $3,000 listed as a domestic support obligation and $2,800 to a Warsaw, Indiana law firm. He listed $6,645 in assets at the time. His bankruptcy filing effectively eradicated all of his debt, and the filing was discharged on March 31, 2020. This kind of financial fuckery is common among narcissists and sociopaths who feel entitled to whatever goods and services they can buy on either their own credit or someone else's, including romantic partners, but they don't tend to feel responsible for paying back those debts and will find any way to avoid it. It's part of their overarching sense of entitlement. I'm not a doctor, and I haven't seen any evidence that Anthony was ever diagnosed with a cluster B personality disorder. I'm simply saying those types of traits are seen all too often in many of the child abusers and murderers I've talked about on the podcast and the blog. On September 24, 2020, Wilkinson Asset Management, acting as the managing agent for the apartment complex where Anthony is accused of killing his son, filed an eviction claim against Anthony. The eviction hearing was held on October 8th, at which time Judge Gerald B. Coleman ordered Anthony officially evicted from the apartment where he slaughtered his little boy setting the date of possession by the managing agent as October 13th at 5 p.m. A damages hearing was scheduled for December 17th, which leads me to wonder if Anthony may be held financially responsible for the crime scene cleanup. Quick tangent, my sincere admiration goes to the people who clean up death scenes. I've watched several documentary-style videos about everything that goes into what they do, and I one million percent wouldn't have the stomach for it. Besides moving furniture, tearing out carpet or other flooring, being exposed to both unthinkable smells and dangerous chemicals, and cleaning up biohazardous materials, they also deal with law enforcement and the emotional families of the recently and sometimes violently deceased. They deserve a lot more recognition than they get. So here's my shout out to death scene cleanup technicians. Thank you for what you do. Although confidentiality rules prohibit DCS officials from commenting on its involvement with Nakota and his parents, it seems Nakota was the focus of a case with the Indiana Department of Child Services when he died. Debbie and Phil Bogue, who became Haley's foster parents when she was 11 and considered Nakota their grandson, confirmed the open DCS investigation to the Indy Star, also telling the reporter about Haley's multiple reports to DCS about Anthony's abuse of Nakota. Phil Bogue said, The court system always just didn't have enough information. There's not enough. We have to drop the case. They listed examples of Anthony's abuse, including his failure to feed Nakota properly, ignoring his son during their scheduled visits, and worse. They said Haley repeatedly voiced her concerns, providing evidence to back up her claims to the court, begging for the unsupervised visits to stop, but no one listened to her. Debbie, who Nakota called Mama, said, I just look at Nakota's picture and see this big, trusting smile and I just think of all the people that have let him down. Phil said, The system failed Nakoda. That's the bottom line. The system failed Nakoda, and it cost him his life. Debbie added, He was just a shining little smile that's now gone. Just a quick note. According to the Indy Star, in Indiana, everyone is a mandatory reporter. It's not only doctors, teachers, and such who are legally obligated to report suspected child abuse and neglect. The law does not require that you have proof, only reason to believe the child is a victim of abuse or neglect. The Indiana Child Abuse Reporting Hotline, which is staffed 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, can be reached at 800-800-5556. You can report anonymously if you wish. Good to know. I've been following Nakoda's case since it broke in July, but while researching for this episode, I came across a YouTube channel I'd never seen that appears to belong to Anthony DeBaya. Hey guys, this is Anthony. Welcome to my channel. Now, um, I recently bought some nice gaming um, stuff. I bought a Dell monitor, I bought MSI desktop, I bought MSI 
laptop. Now, I'm going to take you guys around to show you what I got. Most of the content is video game or workout related, showcasing Anthony talking about his computer setup, his workouts, or screen recordings of him playing video games. But there were a couple videos featuring Nakoda, such as this one in which he unboxes a camera tripod. His voice is just too sweet. Hey guys, my dad recently bought me this Ultra 6061 inch medium duty tripod. But before I unbox it, I'm going to tell you the things about it. Maximum height 61, medium height 24, footed length 25.5, load capacity 11.0, weight 2.6, and I think that's good. So, let's get ready to unbox this. Okay, that. Oh, this looks awesome. Another video featuring Nakoda entitled, My Heart Daddy Love You, was uploaded in October of 2019. It's a slideshow set to upbeat music, consisting of photos of Nakoda and Anthony posing and smiling together in a variety of different surroundings, like on a boat, in a video game store, and at what looks like church. I'll include screenshots of some of those photos in the Facebook album for this episode. The reason I'm mentioning this video is because it physically hurt me to watch it. The ache in my chest, seeing this little boy's big, bright smile during the times he actually enjoyed spending with his father, really brought home the immensity of the betrayal Anthony committed against his own flesh and blood. He's so selfish and self-absorbed that he was willing to destroy the most beautiful and perfect thing he'd ever created, suffocate his own son with a plastic bag, cut his little body into pieces, and throw him away like garbage, just to hurt his ex-girlfriend, who only wanted to protect their son from his abuse. All of the cases I cover are mind-boggling, but the cases that haunt me the most are the ones in which a parent intentionally and cold-bloodedly ends their own child's life. I simply cannot imagine hating anyone more than I love my children. As of this recording in October of 2020, investigators are still searching for Nakoda's remains. They say that on the morning of Sunday, July 19th, Anthony's phone pinged twice near Eagle Creek around the 4500 block of West Vermont Avenue in Indianapolis. Police conducted a thorough search of the area, spending several hours searching heavily wooded areas near Eagle Creek with the assistance of canines while a police helicopter passed repeatedly overhead, all to no avail. All Haley Kelly wants is for her son's body to be found so she can lay him to rest. She told a reporter, His dad threw him out. He dumped his body somewhere and won't let me know. I feel like it's another way of hurting me. It's a brick laying on my chest knowing that I can't have my son to put him at ease. That I would have enough closure that I would be able to function. Some days that I don't think that he's gone. And then there's other days that I have to believe the evidence. Um, and so it's hard. Haley wishes she hadn't handed her son over to his father that fateful weekend but she had previously been ordered to abide by the visitation agreement or face being arrested. After receiving that terrible phone call from a homicide detective, she was so distraught over Nakoda's death that she dropped the phone, went into the bathroom, took too much ibuprofen, and spent four subsequent weeks at the Parkview Behavioral Health Hospital in Fort Wayne, Indiana. She said, I was trying to block the pain. As for DCS, she said, They had the power and responsibility to keep children safe and they didn't do that with my son. My heart goes out to Haley and to Nakoda's 13-year-old sister, J.K. I hope they're able to find peace and that Nakoda's remains can be found to help give them closure. A friend set up a GoFundMe campaign to assist Haley with the costs of laying Nakoda to rest if and when his remains are found. I'll include the link to the GoFundMe in the show notes. Now let's take a moment to remember Nakoda for the amazing, special spirit he was. Nakoda Blake Kelly was a sweet, goofy little boy with a wide, disarming smile, beautiful brown eyes, lots of curly black hair, and glasses. He played baseball for the Wabash Little League, but he loved other sports too, like bowling, football, and wrestling. He loved the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for most of his life. Of course, being a 10-year-old boy, he also loved video games. 
One friend from church reminisced about Nakoda. He had a smile you cannot forget. He was always dressed like a little gentleman. He was ornery and kept me on my toes. I loved his spunky yet sometimes bashful personality. I'm heartbroken. I'm so thankful we know who holds this precious boy now until he can be reunited with those who loved him dearly. Debbie and Phil Bogue said Nakoda loved Marvel superheroes and eating at McDonald's and that he gave his all on the football field. Debbie called him the little trooper. He's a little bitty skinny thing, but man, he had speed and he had drive. Debbie reminisced to the Indie Star about Nakoda, saying she gave him $30 in spending money for his 10th birthday in early July. On their way to the store, he reached over the back seat to hug her, saying, You're the best mamma ever. At the store, he eventually picked out some Ninja Turtles and Marvel action figures, bringing them with him when they went out to eat after their shopping excursion. Debbie said, He was so appreciative of just the littlest things. Nakoda and his older sister, J.K., bickered like most siblings do, but they adored each other and enjoyed playing and spending time with each other. Nakoda was, according to Haley, a mama's boy. Whenever she was sick, he refused to leave her side. If I was sick, he would sit, like, right beside me on the couch. But he said he can't sit too close because he doesn't want to get sick. He would ask if I needed anything, and he would take a blanket and cover me up. He was kind. Um, He would protect anybody that... Um, he cared about. Haley lovingly described Nakoda as a protector who stood up to bullies despite his small stature. He loved reading but wasn't terribly fond of math, and he was sensitive to race issues, telling people his black and white cat named King was biracial like he was. He also, Haley said, loved to cuddle. I love him, and I miss him so much. Rest well, Nakoda. Wherever you are, I hope you're hitting every ball out of the park. That's it for this week, guys. Join me next week for another case. If you like the show, please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. And please subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at www.sufferthelittlechildrenpod.com where you can listen to episodes and become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod and on Twitter at STLCPod. View photos related to today's case on Facebook and Instagram. Read more about today's case and many others at sufferthelittlechildrenblog.com. This podcast was written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dream Note Music. Other music and sound effects for the show were created using sounds from audiojungle.net. Hug your babies a bit closer tonight. Until next week, bye guys.